In the 1990s, one man orchestrated Kenya's largest financial scandal, siphoning off hundreds of millions from the country's coffers, leaving an economic wound that would scar the nation for decades. Today, his name is synonymous with greed and corruption, Kamlesh Patni, the Indian billionaire who allegedly robbed Kenya of $600 million. To understand how Patni exploited Kenya's fragile economy, we need to unravel the roots of the Golden Bag scandal, a meticulously crafted scheme that preyed on Kenya's economic desperation. Using phony gold exports to defraud the government and line the pockets of powerful allies. In the early 1990s, Kenya was facing a financial crisis. Inflation was skyrocketing, the economy was in shambles, and political pressure was mounting. And in the middle of this storm, a quiet figure named Kamlesh Patni crafted a plan so audacious that it would cripple the nation's economy. This scheme was investigated by Al Jazeera and would come to define corruption in Kenya and cost the country upwards of 600 million. Kamlesh Patton wasn't a flashy tycoon, he was a businessman who had found an opportunity to make fast money, partnering with influential figures in the Kenyan government, including high-ranking officials from the Ministry of Finance and Kenya's intelligence services. Patton set up a company called Golden Bag International, and this was no ordinary company. Golden Bag International was ostensibly designed to help Kenya earn foreign currency through gold exports. But here is the catch. Kenya barely had any gold reserves to export. So, how did Patni convince the Kenyan government to get behind this scheme? Well, he appealed to the country's desperation of foreign currency. Under the guise of patriotism and economic innovation, Patni promised he would generate massive foreign exchange revenue for Kenya. All he needed was a special license to export gold and a generous government subsidy to incentivize his new venture. Incredibly, the government agreed. They granted Golden Bag International exclusive rights to exploit gold and paid a whopping 35% subsidy on these exports, much higher than standard rates. This was supposed to offset the cost of exporting and encourage more foreign investment. But here was one glaring problem. Patni wasn't exporting Kenyan gold. According to investigative reports, he was smuggling gold from Congo and later falsely export records to exaggerate the amount. This wasn't just theft. It was an entire system working in sync with corruption extending from government offices to financial institutions, the banks, custom officials, and even Kenya's central bank were robbed into Patni's web ensuring that his fraudulent exports looked legitimate on paper. In reality, Golden Bag's transactions were built on layers of fraud. Government subsidies were paid out as though Kenya's gold trade was flourishing, while in truth, no such exports were happening. All the while, Pugni's coffers were filing up and his political allies were reaping substantial financial rewards. And here is the thing that makes this even more remarkable. Not a single high-profile individual First jail time. You stole billions of taxpayers' sums. Shame on you. Can you know you stole billions and you put away? Patni himself would be acquainted years later walking away from one of, one of Africa's most notorious corruption cases untouched. The impact on Kenya's economy was immediate. With money flowing out of the national reserves to fund this subsidy scheme, inflation surged, and ordinary Kenyans bore the brand of an economic disaster that spiraled out of control. In fact, it's estimated that Kenya lost nearly 10% of its GDP because of this scandal. Think about that. A single scam consuming a tenth of the country's entire economy. What's most tragic is that this wasn't just about financial loss, it was about lost trust. The Golden Bag scandal broke the Kenyan people's faith in their own institution, setting a president that would haunt Kenya's governance for decades. But let's get back to Patni. While the country he claimed to serve was suffering, Patni was basking in the spoils of his scheme. He acquired high-profile properties like the Grand Regency Hotel and continued to rub shoulders with Kenya's elite, even as ordinary Kenyans struggled with raising costs and a devalued currency. The scandal finally came to light in the mid-90s when international lenders, including the International Monetary Fund and World Bank began investigating Kenya's finances. 
Alarmed by irregularities and missing funds, they uncovered the true extent of Goldenberg's fraud. But even with this discovery, justice remained elusive. A judicial inquiry in 2003 laid out in explicit detail the scheme's operations and implicated some of the country's most powerful figures. Yet in a controversial ruling, the court acquitted Putney, citing procedural issues, lost evidence and other technicalities. The Golden Bank scandal wasn't just a failure of economic policy. It was a demonstration of how deep corruption can run when political and business interests collide. This case exposed a grim reality that in Kenya and in many parts of the world, wealth and influence can keep even the most present criminals untouchable. So why did Patney get away with it? The answer lies in the influence he wielded and the web of alleys he maintained. Many of the officials who should have regulated him were instead benefiting from the scheme. Key witnesses vanished, evidence mysteriously disappeared, and some of the most critical government officials involved conveniently passed away before they should testify. Even today, Putney's story isn't over. Recently, he resurfaced in another Al Jazeera investigation, this time accused of running a similar scheme in Zimbabwe, smuggling gold, laundering money, and leveraging political connections. Once again, Putney operates freely, trading gold internationally with ties to the highest levels of power. His recent ventures demonstrate that for figures like Putney, wealth and influence transcend borders. And while Kenya's people bear the scars of his golden bank legacy, Padney remains a global player, adapting his tactics to new countries, new opportunities, and new political allies. After his acquittal in Kenya, Kamlesh Padney didn't simply fade into obscurity. Instead, he took his operation across borders, capitalizing on his infamous methods, and found a new playground for gold smuggling in Zimbabwe. When Padney relocated, Zimbabwe offered a lucrative and surprisingly familiar opportunity the country was dealing with a crippling currency crisis hampered by international sanctions and desperately in need of foreign exchange. In this fragile environment, Patney found his opening, developing a scheme that echoed his golden back days but with a twist. With a new company, Susan General Trading, Patney set up operations in Dubai, a strategic hub for gold trade. While managing the logistics out of Zimbabwe, here's how it worked. Zimbabwe's government, facing limited access to international banks due to sanctions, incentivized gold exports to bring in foreign currency. Patney's company received an official license to export Zimbabwean gold to the Dubai. In reality, however, this arrangement enabled him to use gold as a medium for money laundering. If Golden Bank was about exploiting Kenyan subsidies, this was about gaming Zimbabwe's desperate need for cash flow. Patney wasn't just laundering money, he was leveraging national policies to make his operation look legitimate. In secret meetings captured by Algiers undercover journalists, Patney had laid out his entire process to what he believed were potential Chinese clients. He explained how he could turn their dirty cash into seemingly legitimate income. He would bring cash to Zimbabwe where it would be used to buy gold. Then. Susan General Trading would export the gold to Dubai, transferring the proceeds back into the Dubai bank account as if it were a legitimate profit. The scheme was remarkably effective. Patney reportedly smuggled large sums of cash into Zimbabwe weekly, declaring it as incomes or earnings from his gold exports. His company's role as both the exporter and importer gave him control over both ends of the operation, allowing him to channel the money as he pleased and take a hefty commission for each transaction. This system effectively cleaned the dirty money and even funneled funds back into Zimbabwe's economy, strengthening Patney's local influence. This is a classic case of old tricks in a new setting. Patney transferred what was once a national scandal into a transactional operation, with Zimbabwe's government unintentionally providing the cover of his money laundering machine. The plan worked so smoothly, in part because of Patney's connections. He reportedly boasted of relationships with the high-ranking Zimbabwean officials, claiming that even President Emerson Monangwangwa was aware of the operation. During conversations with undercover reporters, he hinted at the importance of maintaining political alliances. He's mentioning when you work, you must always have the king with you. 
While Patna's gold trade brought cash into Zimbabwe's struggling economy, it also highlighted the country's lack of effective oversight and the thin line between economic necessity and corruption. As the Al Jazeera investigation unveiled, the influence of Patna and other gold smugglers in Zimbabwe was also entrenched that officials seemed almost powerless or perhaps unwilling to intervene. Zimbabwe's economy may have gained some breathing room from these transactions, but it came at a cost. The nation's reputation for corruption depended, and the network of smuggling and money laundering extended its roots into every level of government. This wasn't just a case of one man's audacity. It was a case of how individuals like Patni exploited systematic weaknesses in countries struggling with financial isolation. The very mechanisms meant to stabilize Zimbabwe's economy like encouraging gold exports became tools for an elaborate web of illicit gains. The Al Jazeera investigation not only exposed the extent of Pitney's influence but also broader gold mafia network operating in southern Africa. Patni wasn't alone. He was one of the several key players, each with networks and resources to move millions across borders under the guise of legitimate business. The revelation sparked widespread outrage, prompting Zimbabwean officials to promise investigation. Though skepticism remains about the likelihood of real change, Patna's story in Zimbabwe is the continuation of a pattern. A lucrative cycle of gold, cash, and influence that crosses borders and thrives in the shadows of struggling economies. And while the names may change, the game remains the same.